Hello. I hope you guys are doing well. Today we're going to talk about joint mobilization for the physical therapist assistant. Okay, first we'll talk about muscle grades for manual muscle testing. Um, so they're graded on a zero to five scale. We're going to discuss it more in depth uh, in class. But zero is no contraction. One, you can feel a contraction. There's no movement. Um, two minus and two are with gravity eliminated. That's what GE means. And the difference between a two minus and a two is how much range of motion they have throughout um, with gravity eliminated. And then two plus, anything two plus and above means they have some type of movement against gravity. AG is against gravity. They have some movement. Now how much movement they have determines whether it's a two plus or a three minus. And then once it's a three, they're able to hold the position. They're able to go through full range and hold the position for three seconds. Um, three plus and above is they are able to hold the position against some resistance. So zero, there's nothing there, par paralyzed. One, you feel some type of contraction or see the joint becoming more prominent like it's trying to move. Two minus and two are both with gravity eliminated, um, partial range and then full range. And then two plus to three is against gravity, first partial range, full range, and then able to hold three seconds. Three plus and above, you're able to hold a position against resistance. And this is how we grade a, um, a muscle when we're testing it. And five would be full strength. With joint mobilizations, these are passive skill manual therapy techniques. We use them to address pain and impairments, to address limited, limited range of motion, and altered joint mechanics. Um, why would someone have altered joint mechanics? Well, maybe they're muscle guarding. Maybe they have some swelling in the joint, contractures. If the capsule or the ligaments are adhered to themselves, adhesions, or if they have an oddly shaped joint. Maybe there's, um, from birth, there was a... A defect or whatnot. Um, and mobilization and manipulation are often used interchangeably. Sometimes manipulation is talking more directly about like a, a thrust manipulation, a higher um, level of momentum with the movement and a deeper um, uh, pressure level. But uh, for the most part, manipulation and mobilization will be used interchangeably. Goal of joint mobs. We want to replicate normal joint mechanics, minimize compression on the articular cartilage, so open up the space so it's not pushing on itself, and decrease capsular restrictions. Different types of manipulations um, and mobilization. So a thrust manipulation, which is also known as a high velocity thrust, it's at a quick speed, but it's a short amplitude. So typically we'll take up slack and then at the end of the range, we'll do a quick thrust. Um, PTAs are not allowed to do high velocity thrust. And that's one reason I wanted to mention it first. Um, so this is something that a PT will do, chiropractors do them, but PTAs are not allowed to do high velocity thrust. That's outside of the scope of practice. So now you know about it, and now we'll throw it out because uh, you can't use it. Other types. There's a self-mobilization. So it's like a stretching technique where they either use traction or some type of glide to stretch the joint capsule while they're either laying still, as in the first picture, or moving, as in the sec second picture. So in the first, it's showing an um, inferior glide of the shoulder. That's also kind of an anterior glide of the shoulder. Um, with the... Oh... The inferior glide of the shoulder with the other arm pulling down is like that. You're pulling yourself down. Um, but what she's doing is more of an anterior glide with a weight. And he's doing a posterior glide. Should be really of the talus is typically what you're wanting to increase dorsiflexion. But with the placement of the band, it's probably going to actually glide the tibia posteriorly. Um, but those are examples of self-mobilizations. Other types, there's a mobilization with movement. So either the PT or a piece of equipment holds the patient in position while they passively um, or they actively move into different positions. So um, in the first one, he's pushing and she's lifting her arm up. In the second one, there is a lateral glide while she does either 
a lunge or some type of movement. Um, so the therapist is doing a distraction force to open up the joint and then the patient is doing um, a movement. That's mobilization with movement. There are various types of joints. So an ovoid joint is where one surface is convex and one is concave. So that's kind of perfect with how we talk about joint mobs. One is convex, one is concave. The ankle and the shoulder are examples of these. A stellar joint means each surface has parts that are concave and parts that are convex. They fit into each other, but various movements that are done, the mechanics change because it depends on which part of the joint is moving. The thumb is an example of that. We have so many um, degrees of freedom and movements at the thumb because both surfaces are both uh, convex and concave. Long bone movements, this is kind of what we talk about when we see somebody move. We say shoulder flexion, shoulder abduction. These are known as long bone movements. We also call them swing when we're talking about osteokinematics or um, arthrokinematics. We're talking about swing and uh, they're movements of the bony lever, the long bone. It's measured with a goniometer and it's also referred to as range of motion. On the other hand, accessory motions are movements within the joint themselves. It's necessary for normal range of motion, but we cannot perform them actively. So if you say flex your shoulder, a person can do that actively. If you say um, glide the shoulder inferiorly without some passive motion, they cannot just reproduce that movement on their own. Um, examples of those are distraction, sliding, which is also known as gliding, compression, rolling, and spinning. Um, some other involuntary movements are component motions. These are motions that are outside of the joint that are not under voluntary control. So like scapulohumeral rhythm. So if the muscles um, are all working correctly, there's no um, muscle imbalance where one is tight and one is weak, then with normal shoulder movements, your scapula has normal movements that it automatically does as well. Now once one area gets tight or an area gets weak or anything like that, it can throw that off and we need to target those muscle imbalances in order to help with component motions. But it's not a motion that the person is thinking of. As I raise my arm, let me also um, rotate my scapula outwards or let me also elevate my scapula. None of that is going on in your head. It's not voluntary. Joint play is passive joint motions that cannot pro be produced actively. Typically, when we're doing joint mobilizations, we're using joint play, where we need to have enough joint play space within the joint in order to get a good mobilization and in order to get a normal movement with full range of motion. So joint play is passive. That's what the therapist is doing with their own hands. The patient is not doing that actively. So we're taking up slack. We're stretching the capsule. That's all passive movements. Normal accessory motions. I love this picture because it shows all the different accessory motions, um, glide and spin and um, all of those distraction and compression um, in a nice little picture. So in order to have our normal accessory motions, we must have adequate joint play and we must have adequate capsule laxity. So if the capsule itself that surrounds the joint is tight in an area, we need to stretch that out or it will block the accessory motions, which will either just cause compression and impingement or limit the range of motion in that joint. Um, abnormal excessive or abnormal accessory motions increase <laughs> compression and cause tissue breakdown. I just said that. All right, so we're gonna talk about roll versus glide. Now roll um, happens in surfaces that are incongruent. So basically one is convex and one is concave, incongruent, they're not the same, versus glide is more congruent surfaces that look alike and slide on top of each other. Um, a new point on one surface touches new points on the other. So you how I'm rolling onto new points on the other surface. Um, and it produces a movement in the same direction as the swinging bolt, so, bone. So uh, if this is going, we'll call that superior. The long bone is moving superior. The roll is also superior, okay? 
if the long bone is going superior, it's going in the same direction. Uh, compression occurs in the um, direction that the bone is swinging towards. So as I roll in forward, I'm compressing forward and distraction in the opposite direction. So as I'm going superiorly, it's compressing above and distracting or opening up below. Um, and a normal healthy joint roll always occurs with other accessory motions. So most accessory motions are combined it shouldn't just be one thing. With roll, if it only was rolling, there would be compression, but also eventually it would roll off the joint and dislocate. So you have to have another accessory motion combined with roll. So if I was trying to stay in the middle of the joint and I was rolling one way, if I didn't glide in the opposite direction, then I would roll off the joint. With slide or glide, it happens in congruent surfaces that look alike. The same point on one surface comes in contact with new points on the other. So this area is the only portion that's coming in contact with new uh, surface on the other. Um, it's coupled with other accessory motions um, because there's not a single body part that is completely congruent. We don't have any parts that are just completely flat and it's two blocks sliding on each other. Um, so with a concave surface, the movement happens in the same direction as the long bone. So if this is now the long bone moving around a convex surface, then as it moves uh, superiorly, we'll say, then the um, slide occurs superiorly as well. So with a concave surface, everything happens in the same direction. This is how a wrench works. What type of wrench is that? I always forget. Um, and so, as you're pulling it up, it's also gliding up. As you're going forward, it's also gliding forward. Same, same direction. With a convex surface, the glide is in the opposite direction. As I said, with a convex surface, it's going to roll. It's going to roll in the same direction as the movement of the long bone or the swing. Hold on. Sorry. But if it just rolls, it's going to roll off the joint. If it wants to stay in the center of the joint, it must glide in the opposite direction. So as we roll superiorly, the glide must be inferior in order to stay in the middle of the joint. So with a convex surface, cave, you can go inside, vex, it's pointing out, convex surface, the um, glide is in the opposite direction of the long bone movement or the swing. So as I go superiorly, the glide is inferior. Okay. Um, Roll versus glide. The more congruent the surfaces are, the more gliding takes place. The more incongruent the surfaces are, the more rolling takes place. Um, if there's dysfunction, microtrauma, muscle imbalances, weakness, any of that, then the, the joint mechanics become abnormal. And this leads to dysfunction, it increases your risk of injury, and it increases the use of compensatory muscles. So as the joint mechanics are altered, it creates more of a muscle imbalance, pain, impingement, damage to the tissues, and increases your likelihood of um, being injured. With spin, so rotation of a segment around a stationary axis. I love this compass. You point, put one point in the ground and the pencil moves around it. That is spin. Um, so as the bone spins, the same point on one surface creates an arc on the other. Um, so the same point, like the point of the pencil, creates an arc on the surface it's spinning around. Um, typically, this is simultaneous with roll and glide, and some of the examples are shoulder flexion and extension, hip flexion and extension, um, radial humeral pronation supination. So as I'm going up, the bone is spinning around as well. So there's some roll, there's some glide, and there's some spin. With joint mobilizations, we are using glide. We do not use spin because it's really hard to reproduce and what do we need it for? I mean, we need it, but what do we use it for? Um, with roll, we do not use roll because there's compression involved. So if the whole point of joint mobs is to uh, increase movement and decrease tissue damage, we don't want any compression because that increases tissue damage. So with, so with joint mobilization, we always use glide. 
So remember with a concave surface, you're going in the same direction as the longboat movement. With a convex, you're going in the opposite direction with your joint mobilization. So if you're wanting to improve uh, shoulder flexion up to uh, 90 degrees, that's an anterior movement of the long bone. And so a posterior joint mobilization, posterior glide to the shoulder would be what we would use. Passive angular stretching. This is a different type of joint mobilization where the bony lever is used to stretch the joint capsule. So he has, uh, the therapist has the patient's leg over his knee and he's just doing a long passive angular stretch. So he's pushing on the bottom there and stretching the front of the capsule. We don't prefer this. It's painful and there's a risk of trauma because it's not specific. It uses a high magnitude of force um, it causes rolling, it causes compression of the joint, and it's really not similar to our normal joint mechanics. So this is kind of a not used very often, like if maybe they have some significant scar tissue to break through or something, maybe something like that might be used. Otherwise, this is not the preferred method, but it's called passive angular stretching. With joint glide stretching, we use the glide component to stretch a tight capsule. So this is typically what we use with joint mobilizations. We figure out where the limitation is. We get them to a safe range, either beginning range would be more comfortable, end range would be more effective in stretching the joint capsule. And then um, we get really close to the joint surface and provide a very controlled movement and stretch of the joint capsule. So there's more controlled, so high, lower intensity, there's less compression, and it's a smaller amplitude of movement. So it is preferred over passive angular stretching, and this is typically what we're referring to when we're talking about joint mobilization. With approximation, that's putting two surfaces together. You can also call it uh, compression of the joints. Um, so when you're approximating joints, you're pushing them together. Although this is compression itself, um, it occurs during weight bearing. It can help provide stability of the uh, joints. It can help move synovial fluid in order to uh, maintain the joint health. If there's too much compression, it's going to degenerate the cartilage and cause damage. But just enough is good for your proprioception. It gives the brain feedback about where your limbs are in space and um, is very helpful with motor planning, with um, getting your reflexes to integrate, with uh, calming the system. So oftentimes in pediatric therapy, I would have patients crawl around because crawling is great. It gives you joint compression on basically all the joints, all of the upper and lower extremity joints, and then do a movement and they would have much more coordination and control of that movement because they just got a lot of input to their brain about what's going on in their hands and in their feet and their legs and their arms. With distraction, that's pulling apart, separating um, to a joint surface. So it's also a longitudinal pull. Can, um, traction does the same thing. It opens the joint space. It frees and uh, unrestricts the movement decreases the stress, and it's more comfortable for the patient. Most of the time when I do a joint mob, I distract partially before I do the mobilization. So you do like a light distraction to open the space up and then do a gentle glide in the direction that you're trying to stretch so that you, there's, you're making sure there's no compression there. Um, with proprioception, as I talked to before, um, as we move, there are nerve impulses going to our brain to tell us where our body is. When we have swelling, injury, or degeneration of an area, it decreases our proprioception, and this decreases our balance. One great example is an ankle sprain. An ankle sprain greatly affects your balance because there are so many um, nerves in that area providing feedback about what is going on with your balance and with your movements of the legs. So anytime somebody has an ankle sprain, I would advise given having therapy afterwards um, to improve their balance and get them back. Or they're, the, the other bad thing is they're more likely to sprain their ankle again and again unless they have proper therapy. Um, the things that joint motion provides as far as proprioception, they, it provides feedback on your static position, on your speed of movement, 
the direction of movement, your muscle tone and regulation, and on pain, painful stimuli. All right, when would we not do joint mobilization? So contraindications, if they're already hypermobile, we don't need to increase their mobility, they already have too much. If there's significant joint effusion, then we don't want to move the area. We probably wouldn't be able to move anyway. It would probably block it. Um, significant inflammation. Uh, precautions. Malignancy, we don't want to uh, spread any uh, infection or cancer, especially. Any bone disease. If there's an unhealed fracture, I really think that should be a contraindication, but I guess it just depends on what you're mobilizing. If the fracture is way far away from where you're mobilizing, of course it would be okay. If they have excessive pain and they're screaming, that's too much. I would not do a joint mobilization in that case. Poss possibly maybe just oscillations, but otherwise, no. Um, if joints around them are already hypermobile and the restriction there is actually increasing their stability, then you would not do joint mobs there. If they had a recent joint replacement, you wouldn't do it, but you also wouldn't need it. The mechanics are already good in that new joint, so they don't need the capsule stretched or anything, the mechanics are not altered in the new joint. Um, if the connective tissue is weak and you do joint mobs, you could damage it, so I would definitely avoid it in a weak or uh, diseased connective tissue, and if they already have diminished circulation. All right, so pain with joint mobs. When pain occurs before the movement is restricted, we say pain is the limiting factor. In this instance, gentle joint mobs are recommended to decrease pain and to increase joint play. Um, if the pain occurs with the tissue limitation, so you get to the end range and then they say, yes, that hurts. Then you just perform gentle joint mobs again. You be careful because there may be some tissue damage there and some fragile tissues, and that's why they're having pain at end range. So be very careful with joint mobilizations in there. If pain occurs after the tissue restriction or tissue limitation is met, so you're at end range and they're like, no, and then you push a little bit past and they're like, yeah, that's painful. Then um, it's because the capsule is tight or the articular surfaces. So this is where joint play techniques can be performed and you can aggressively apply joint mobs to break through adhesions um, and you're not as concerned about injury. So if the pain occurs before there's any limitation, then pain is the limiting factor. You need to do gentle mobs just to relax the patient to decrease their pain. If pain occurs with the limitation right as they reach end range, there's probably some weak damaged tissues there. Be very careful with your joint mobs. If it occurs after you kind of reach end range, if you do overpressure, it's painful, then you know that the capsule is tight or there's scar tissue or adhesions and you need to do some aggressive mobs to break that up. Documentation, what do we document after we do joint mobilizations? The rate of force applied, the location, so what area we did the joint mobilization, how much movement they had there, the direction, the target of force, their position, and what joint was being mobile. Remember your main reason for documenting, one of the main ones is so that somebody else could read it and reproduce that same treatment. So anything that you did, put the specifics down so somebody could reproduce that. All right, grades of mobilization. There's two different types of um, joint mobilizations. One is called oscillation. Oscillation is more kind of quick, um, shaky movements. And there's four grades of that. That's what we'll talk about first. So grade one oscillation is a very small rhythmic oscillation at um, beginning range and it's kind of what we do if we hit with our elbow and we start just kind of shaking our elbow we naturally do a grade one oscillation it's for pain gating it's to increase relaxation decrease uh, the pain to the area and pain gating is just providing a signal that beats the pain signal to the brain so it's the race in there it's going first and so your brain gets the pain signal less with a grade two, it's more of a large amplitude. So with the grade one, pretty much just your skin is moving. With a grade two, you're moving through the range, but not reaching in range. Um, typically you do two to three per second, and you can continue those oscillations for one or two minutes. Grade one and two are both primarily used to decrease pain and muscle guarding, to kind of prepare for movement, range of motion, or uh, deeper joint mobilizations.
with a grade three. It's a um, rhythmic oscillation, but it reaches in range and into tissue restrictions. So you're still doing large movements, but you're reaching the end of the range and stretching partially the capsule. So again, two to three um, reps per second for one to two minutes with a grade three oscillation. Now with a grade four, you basically take up the slack and then do small amplitude movements at the very end range and into the tissue restrictions. So it's like a manual vibration, but you're already at end range. So you take up the slack and then once you meet the resistance, you keep doing oscillations at the end. It's to stretch the capsule and loosen up restrictions. Now grade uh, one through three can be done without any special instructions or permission from the supervising PT, but for a PTA, a grade four um, can only be done if the supervising PT has documented that they are comfortable with the PTA performing grade four oscillations on this patient. So it is within the scope, but you have to kind of have special permission written down and documented in order to do a grade four um, oscillation. And with any of the oscillations, if you vary the speed of the oscillation, then it can change the effect that it has on the patient. So typically two to three per second is the ideal for most of these. All right, um, the other type of joint mobilization is a sustained stretch. So grade one is also small amplitude. It's more of a distraction. There's no stress on the capsule. So you're just kind of opening up the space. And typically we use this with all of our joint mobs in order to open it up and decrease compression and relieve pain as we're doing other joint mobilizations. So it's just a very gentle opening of the space. You're not putting any pressure on the capsule, you're just opening and allowing room for another type of joint mobilization. With a grade two, there is enough distraction or translation to meet in range. So you're distracting enough to get full movement. Um, you can use it to determine their sensitivity, to decrease their pain, and to maintain what joint play they already have. With a grade three, there's enough force applied to stretch the joint capsule and the um, surrounding structure, structure, so it's used to stretch and to increase their joint play. Typically, you hold it for more than six seconds and then partially release, and then repeat slow stretches three to four seconds each. That's a sustained stretch. So with oscillations, remember we do two to three per minute. With a sustained stretch, you must hold it for several seconds for it to be considered a sustained stretch. Now be very careful using sustained stretch with oscillations. If you're using a grade one sustained stretch to do oscillations, that's great. Anything higher than that, you have to be careful because if you're taking up slack in the joint capsule one way and then pushing in another way, you could easily damage um, or tear tissues if you're not really careful. Um, high velocity thrust we talked to, you take up the slack, start it in range and then do a quick thrusting movement to snap adhesions or to reposition a dislocation and this is not within a PTA's scope of practice. Um, positioning, we want to make sure the patient is comfortable and it allows them to relax and um, put them in a loose pack position which I'll go over next. Um, as you progress, then you can actually put the patient more towards uh, end range and their limitation and then do the joint mobs um, to progress them to an even deeper stretch. Make sure you stabilize proximally and then mobilize distally as always. Um, and we want to be very close to the place that we are um, mobilizing so that we can really control the movement and the speed of movement and exactly how much force is being applied. All right, so the resting position is also called the open pack or loose pack position and this is just the position where the greatest movement is possible. It's used for testing and for your initial joint mobilizations. So when we start doing joint mobs or we start testing and assessing their um, joint movements, we put them in an open pack position, a position where the, um, uh, the joint is most open. Okay, a few things to keep in mind while you're doing joint mobilizations. Uh, the treatment is applied as close to the opposing surface as possible. Um, 
the larger the contact surface, the more comfortable it is for the patient. The smaller, you can get more specific, but it's very uncomfortable for the patient. Typically only a grade one distraction should be used with grade three glide. So we're talking about the sustained stretch versus the oscillations because you don't want to overstretch and injure the patient. Um, other particulars, the treatment plane, so TP in this picture is for treatment plane, is um, perpendicular to the line of the axis of rotation. So here, here's the axis of rotation and aligned to that the treatment plane is perpendicular. The glide is parallel to the treatment plane and distraction is perpendicular to the treatment plane. Some more helpful hints if the bone um, is convex, the glide will be in the opposite direction of the swing. Remember that. If the moving bone is concave, then the glide will be in the same direction of the swing. All right, when we assess the patient, if they have pain for more than 24 hours or soreness for more than 24 hours, then the treatment was too aggressive and they should really, the therapist should really back off next time. If they feel the same or better, then the next treatment can repeat the same procedure or progress it if needed. Um, you need to reassess the patient's range of motion after doing a joint mobilization and at the start of the next treatment to see if increased motion was kept. And then the home exercise program must take the patient through their full range of motion, any range of motion that they've gained in order to maintain what uh, improvements that you've gotten through those joint mobilizations. So always add range of motion in the home exercise program and instruct them to do it daily in order to maintain the increased motion they've gained. Uh, the sequence of joint mobs, typically we warm the tissues up, we relax the muscles, we perform joint mobs, passively stretch the patient, then lead them through their new range of motion, and then educate them on how to maintain that. So you could have them come in and start with heat or with warm up on a bike or something, um, do some kind of oscillations to relax, then do your joint mobs, then passive range of motion, and then exercises that do active or active assistive range of motion or, in order to maintain that while they're gone. Mobilization with movement, we talked about earlier. Um, first, you assess and say, do they have pain or a limited range of motion? That tells you they need the mobilization with movement. Um, and you teach them passive techniques where the therapist either holds them into a position or a piece of equipment holds them into the position while they move through the range. Um, if this is really uncomfortable and painful, then the technique is not appropriate. If it is appropriate, perform six to 10 reps with accessory motion uh, maintained, and then do, you could do some loading at the end range if you need to, to increase your gains. Um, if you teach them mobilization with movement, um, then it can become part of their home exercise program once they've mastered it. They definitely don't wanna do it with poor form. And the last thing we're going to talk about, manipulation under anesthesia. If somebody has significant amount of scar tissue that develops, they may have to be put to sleep and do an intense breakthrough of the scar tissue. A surgeon would do that, not a PT. Um, but that's one reason it is so key to maintain um, their movement because nobody wants to get put back to sleep and jerked around to break through their scar tissue. So it's important for us to do our job so we can avoid that. All right, that's it for today. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'll see you.